hotel room last night, so I typed up like some talking points because I figure as soon as I'm just on a stage and have to say something that I thought about before seeing the crowd, <laughs> that I would forget it as soon as I saw the crowd. Um, Man, like this brings me back to high school. I, I'd volunteered to go first to present some sort of script or like like line from a book, and then as soon as I get on the stage, I'm like, and uh, it was just terrible. Um, and then when I ran for class president in high school, and I totally lost, I was like wearing this zebra striped getup with like some pink accents, and then ended up singing "Fly Me to the Moon." So, <laughs> all to avoid giving an actual speech. Say, okay, so. Isn't this kind of amazing? I mean, everybody said how amazing, how big the crowd is, and then there's this other room with the telecast, so there's like twice this. Um, but imagine if our classes were like this with like the representation of women in it. And I think that that's something um, that you don't get to really experience often, especially in, in STEM. Like, you're, you're lucky if it's anywhere near 50-50. So just seeing us all together and knowing that we've been through those experiences is just so great. And uh, man, it's never been a better time to be a woman in tech, but we know that we're making it better. Um, and I think events like this are like some of the steps towards that. So I can't wait for our daughters and our nieces to like make their career choice completely independent of some outdated stereotype. So like, what is it that you wanna do when you grow up? Is this something that like girls would do versus boys would do? That's gonna be out of the picture. And I think that we're really doing a good job now of making sure that those stereotypes are actively uh, pushed against. But I'd also hope that soon, um, like, gender will be decoupled from our achievements and accolades. Because I feel really just, like, honored and, like, random that I get to be here on a stage rather than in the audience, right? Um, and, you know, like, I hope that one day I do something where this is just cool on its own. It doesn't matter who did it. Um, but, you know, part of like the, the steps of going towards a stage where we really do have that whole pipeline of women in uh, tech careers or in academia filled uh, involves making sure that we recruit at the lower level. So I, I, whatever the media does, I guess they, they do their thing. Um, so I figure I have my 15 minutes. Um, I'll try to share stories because I, I, what else do we have really? Um, but before I get into those, in case I go like way off or something, uh, I guess I wanted to impart the three wishes that I had for each of us. So first is that we don't succumb to the people who wanna make us doubt ourselves. So we know that there are people online and maybe people in classes, depending on where you go to school, um, that are haters. <laughs> And I think it's uh, just best to be able to realize that that's irrelevant to what you're going to do, because you know what you want to do and, and you're gonna do that. Um, second would be that we can resist pressure from the people who wanna plan our future for us. And the thing with that is that I feel like a lot of times people in your life are very much there for you and they support you, but they might have some vision for what you are going to do that doesn't align with yours. So it's hard sometimes to really separate that out and make sure that you are doing what you want to do. And I guess the third wish that I would have for us is that you know we're all in technical fields and that means that we've spent years learning just the groundwork to then do our jobs. And that's kind of scary if you think about the fact that like what if your interests change or what if you realize you wanna do something else. Um, so I hope that we're not afraid to um, of the lost time and like the, the idea that we've lost this time doing one thing or learning one thing if we end up deciding to change course because I think it's important to just be able to go with what you feel like is the right thing to do and not be afraid of, of maybe what you've been prepared for in the past. Okay, so now to the storytelling, I guess. Who here was a weird kid? Yeah, yeah. It's cool now. I think it's cool now. <laughs> I thought it was cool when I was a kid. <laughs> um, but, okay, so I'm trying to, like, so I guess the big thing I want to convey is somehow, like, surrounding yourself with talented people helps you so much. And so this is where being together like this and hopefully talking to each other more than you listen to people like me on stage is, is important because, like, just even when I, like, first started elementary school, I was in kindergarten, and every morning they'd have snack time. And there were these cups with jokes on them. 
And Allison knew how to read, much better than anybody else in the class. So whenever everybody got those joke cups, they would run over to Allison and ask her to read them out loud. And I was like, why can't I be like Allison? So we went to the grocery store, my parents and I, and we bought like all of the same cups with riddles on them so that I could learn the words on those and then be the same person. Now, I didn't necessarily get the other kids to come and ask me to read it because there's a people skill element that, I, <laughs> that was not quite developed at, in kindergarten. But the same thing, Matt knew his multiplication tables, and soon enough, I learned my multiplication tables. And it's just fun to be around people that have skills that you want to have, <laughs> whether or not you're like just a kindergartner being exposed to other kids that have a little bit more background for the first time or um, at a later stage in life. And I think it's important also that it's in person, because I feel like when you go online and you see these people doing interesting stuff, there's this kind of otherness to that. Like you're not, you're not relating necessarily with them, with, with their background, and trying to get a sense of what it took for them to get to the stage where they're doing this interesting thing you wish you could do. Um, it's much easier to get to that stage when you know the person and you've seen where they're coming from, how much work went into getting that skill, so that you know that you can do that yourself. And I mean, some examples of this are like, there's one arcade game. And I was in this uh, water park in Wisconsin, and this kid could win this arcade game, like, hands down all the time. And I thought that would be cool. I wish I could do that. And sure enough, you practice at this game, and you can do that. And you feel so good, because you're the one kid in the arcade, like, getting all these tickets and winning the prizes that you want. And <laughs> like you, so you know, there, there's a certain like, sort of cross-section of how likely an event is, right? So it has to be large enough that you saw somebody in the first place playing this game well and then small enough that it, it's still cool that you're good at it. But as soon as you go online and you Google this game, you can see that there's a whole forum of people who say how easy it is and they're good at it. And you're like, really? Like, I thought that I had this cool skill. And apparently everybody else thinks they do too. And so it's, sometimes it's good to just be a little bit isolated and um, be able to relish like, things that you enjoy, that you feel like accomplished, and not try to normalize it to other things people say that they're good at or whatever. Uh, so one other thing is I'll speak very quickly when I'm a little bit excited. So <laughs> I'll try to slow down. Uh, OK. Another thing, because I'm in an academic background, I would say is the way that we can empower people through learning. Um, I think that there's something unfortunate about the fact that we all have to go through how many years of education and not all of us enjoy school. So, I mean, lucky for me, I do well in school and I get to stay in school forever, right? It's not necessarily um, what everybody wants. Um, but I thought it was fun in high school, the first math class I took that was advanced, I was with a bunch of other students, some of them had failed the course last year, and we were teaching each other this stuff. And I think that if there's one thing maybe that can be improved upon is the way that we tend to grade students and try to like separate out, oh, you're going to be good at this one thing or whatnot. But really, I think giving some sort of power to the people who maybe might not have done well in something and having them teach people who know less about that than them makes them feel like they have some sort of command over the subject. And I think that really we can try to make um, Make more, make more people engaged in the learning process and really open things up because we don't want somehow how you did early on in your academic career, whether it's in high school, before high school, to determine whether or not you get to have this awesome tech career later in your life, right? So this is opening up the pipeline. Okay. Then finally, as far as learning goes, I guess this is a theme I was trying to think of something to say, is uh, learning from mistakes. So. I was the type of person who would just always obsess over exams. I did well in school. I get like good grades because I cared about grades. And in hindsight, you know, grades don't really matter. It's what you're doing. It's what you're interested in that matters. But it is interesting to find the fact that you can just obsess over something or care about something and use that to motivate you. So I knew that I would over obsess about some things and sometimes that's a flaw, but sometimes you can use that to really harness your like focus on something. Um, and <laughs> And the final weird kid situation, I remember I tried to be really clever with this uh, application um, for my uh, PhD funding. So you have an interview round where you're supposed to go in and 
answer some questions and hopefully you get to the next round and your PhD is going to be paid for. Now, what happened was I knew the room where this interview was going to be. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go in in the middle of the night to the MIT Media Lab and write on the board stuff from a paper that I had just written, thinking that, oh, when I come back in the morning, they're going to uh, like see this and then it'll be a funny joke, right? I'll be like so prepared. So on the one hand, it kind of worked. I came in in the morning, had my interview, the first one in the morning, and their quiz was to explain what was on the board. And I was like, ha ha, I wrote that on the board. So I felt pretty good about myself at that moment. Then the end of my interview session came and I went to try to erase said board. And I realized that I had written in permanent marker on that board. So immediately my like, pride in the fact that I got them turned into this ultimate shame. There was a Harvard-Yale football game that, um, that uh, afternoon and the whole time I'm just running through my head exactly what had happened and how I grabbed the Sharpie and why they had a Sharpie in a room with a whiteboard wall. Um, <laughs> And then I came back in the evening and had like alcohol, like just tons of isopropyl to clean off this board. And it worked, it reached, but it, 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 everything was clean, so no, no damage to property. But it's just, I think it's funny because I was so embarrassed and yet tried to do something to show that I was like on top of things and it utterly did not work. But I ended up getting the fellowship and everything, so it worked out in, in the big scheme of things, but it's just, those little things in life where you feel so embarrassed that you just keep thinking about it and then like, you think that's the only thing that matters and you realize that <laughs> it's such a small story. Um, okay. Okay, so now I've rambled really quickly about all these little uh, stories about education and whatnot. I think that one of the main, I guess, ideas if I could convey anything would be the fact that we have the ability to have a plan, but should be willing to change course. So a large fraction of my story is kind of the arc to trying to get to uh, working at an aerospace company. So right by the time I was 12, I had this like career path in mind. I would learn how to fly, I would build a plane, I would go to MIT, and then I would work for a start in an aerospace company. And just having that whole thing lined out it's kind of scary if you think about it. Like, you're 12 years old, you don't know anything, right? And yet you think you know where you're going to go. And ironically, when you're so, like, this tunnel vision for, I guess, where you're heading and you know the next step that you can do, uh, it's funny that you can do those next steps. Like, in hindsight, I'm, like, it's interesting that I was able to, to like, you know, put together this kid plane and do all these, like, like networking with people at air shows and get to the like the stage where I knew what I wanted to do um, without like any really good technical knowledge. So I think that if anything, I would hope that everybody here can hold on to their naivety as long as possible because you can do a lot more um, than you're aware that you can when you're unaware of what you can't do. Um, so <laughs> and that's the funny thing because so I was basically on this track. Then I went to my undergrad, and we had to take physics courses uh, for the like, requirement for the graduate to graduate um, from MIT. And I fell in love with my physics courses. They just seemed to come more naturally, and I, I liked physics, and just left all that behind. <laughs> Did a couple internships uh, in aerospace, and realized that I wanted to do physics now. And the funny thing is when I realized I wanted to do physics, I don't think I even knew what I wanted to do in physics, because Within physics, right, you have the popular science. You see what Brian Greene tells you about. You see what NOVA presents to you. And that is a whole different thing from what you see in your classes, which is another thing from what you see in advanced textbooks, and is an entirely different thing than what you see in the archive. So I think that all of us at some point have or will appreciate the fact that when, what draws us into our technical fields is not necessarily what will keep us in those fields. Um, like, you have to be either like, willing to search for what it is that like, kind of kindled that like, fire in you when you were younger, when you first knew that you wanted to go into this range of, of topics, to something that you realize this is the product I'll be working on, this is the um, research program that I'll be working on. So 
I think that the best thing that we can all like, appreciate that we are doing is that we're learning how to learn. So anytime we invest years of our lives into learning technical details for some subfield, whether or not we end up staying with that for the rest of our lives, even though it's nice to think that we're preparing, we're doing all this work so that we're going to have that knowledge base ready to go, it's we've learned how to learn or teach ourselves what we need to. And I think especially with the way that things are so rapidly developing, if you're in industry, then it's good to be able to basically recalibrate and, and, and acquire new skill sets continually. So that's really something I think that we all end up appreciating at some point. Um, when you do like high energy theoretical physics research, you have some big picture questions like, do you want to understand quantum gravity? Like that's a cool buzzword. But in practice, you're working on these problems that are harder and harder to explain to your mom and dad, like what is even the, the question statement. And I find it interesting because somehow I've gotten so warped in my sense of interesting. Uh, if you walk around a physics department, I think you'll hear two words repeated the most. It's either trivial or interesting. So <laughs> the dichotomy says something about the fact that like either something is known or something is unknown and we find the things that we don't understand to be interesting <laughs> if we want to understand that thing. So the one thing too that I would, I guess, take away from that type of experience is that I hope that we all stay as long as possible in the sweet spot where we're willing to ask for help. Because the thing about very technical fields is I feel like at first when you're this wide-eyed kid coming in and just enamored by science, you have wonderful professors who are nice to the undergrads and will tell you, oh yeah, you can do anything, keep asking these questions. And then at some point, you start being like, you get this feeling that maybe you shouldn't be asking those questions. And that's mostly because you start to understand what people are talking about and that you don't quite know exactly what they're talking about. So you need to like rethink your questions, you overthink your questions too much. Um, and then you can go one of two ways. Either you can completely ignore the fact that you maybe should have learned this at some point and ask those questions and actually learn it. Or you can try to hide away and study. And I think that all too often in the course of a six year long PhD, you're willing to hide away and study for much too long uh, compared to what you actually need to. So, and depending on the field, I think that if you have a shorter like, turnaround time, it's more encouraged to, to recognize that you are not an expert yet on the sub thing that you need to know and go out and ask that. So I hope that we all <laughs> don't uh, fall into the trap of thinking that we need to know more than we do because we are where we are, and um, it's better to ask for help than to, to, like, to, to try to think that you already needed to know something. So I hope that in the rest of the summit, you guys talk to each other a ton, hear each other's stories, and uh, seek out advice from one another. Because I think that the more opinions you have um, when it comes to what it is that you should maybe do as a next step, the better you're off because you can decide which advice to take. Um, collecting mentors uh, is something that's valuable because you don't just want to have one voice that isn't your own guiding you. So those are my two or three cents. And I really can't wait to see what we all do because right, there's how many of us here? Like, like five something thousand? Uh, you know that in a couple of years we're going to be doing great things. Some of them, like statistically, we have to be doing something great. So it would be really fun to see what that is and keep track of that. So...